announcing the arrival of Professor Datuk Dr. Muhammad Amin Jalaluddin, Vice Chancellor, University of Malaya, and Professor Dr. Awang Bugiba, Awang Mahmud. Please be seated. Assalamualaikum and good morning. Yang berbahagia, Professor Datuk Dr. Muhammad Amin Jalaluddin, Vice Chancellor, University of Malaya, Professor Dr. Awang Bulgiba, Management of University of Malaya, Management of the Faculty of Medicine, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. Welcome to the inaugural lecture by Professor Dr. Awang Bulgiba entitled the realization of a dream. It is now my pleasure to call upon Professor Datuk Dr. Muhammad Amin to introduce Professor Dr. Awang Bulgiba and invite him for the lecture. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera. Uh, One, uh, this morning, uh, pagi yang murni ini, di sekali lagi kita berkumpul bersama-sama untuk mendengar saran perdana uh, dan ada satu proses of ilmuwan uh, di Universiti Malaya ini. Tapi kali ini di di, di, di Danarash uh, Fakulti Perubatan Auditorium. 
Uh, yang saya hormati rakan saya dan juga yang akan memberi syarahan perdana Profesor Dr. Awang Bugibah, uh, Awang Am Muhammad. Begitu juga Dekan Fakulti Perubatan, teman-teman Dekan Fakulti Perubatan, Dekan-dekan dan juga pengarah daripada Universiti Malaya, Fakulti-Fakulti di Universiti Malaya dan terutama sekali warga Universiti Malaya dan warga fakulti. Tuan-tuan dan puan-puan sekalian. Uh, Alhamdulillah Selalunya syarahan perdana ini terutama sekali di Fakulti Perubatan kita buat belah petang. Uh, that's why I can see today tak banyak clinician kerana semua dekat klinik unfortunately. Tapi memang ada yang free itu ada dalam uh, klinik auditorium ini. Eh? Jadi ladies and gentlemen, uh, allow me to introduce our uh, I mean Professor Dr. Awang uh, di mana he is the first Malaysian doctors to gain a PhD in health informatics. Profesor Awang Bugibah uh, yang adalah alumni Universiti Malaya MBBS-nya di sini dan banyak lagi dia punya qualification terutama yang yang yang, yang ter ter orang kata uh, the latest uh, he is being awarded as a fellow of a Science Academy of Science Malaysia. He is currently Deputy Vice Chancellor Research and Innovation and also Professor of Public Health Epidemiology and Biostatic Unit. In the University of Malaya, Dr. Awang Bugiba has had an illustrious work history from time he started working in UM for now 16, I mean 16 years ago. And he started off as an ordinary lecturer in the Department of Social and Preventive Medicine in 1998. Within a year, he had created the first department website in the Faculty of Medicine and Network uh, at the Social Preventive Medicine Department Computer Lab for less than 200 ringgit that time. Because eh? now, kalau you, we ask him to construct the website, I'm sure that 25,000 ringgit is worth. Because I know that uh, under Majlis Fosa Negara, that's why I said I'm being conned or not. Eh? But they constructed a website of 25,000 ringgit. I said uh, to my colleague in uh, Majlis Fosa Negara, I think that 25,000 ringgit is too much. Maybe the value of today, but the value 16 years ago is 200 ringgit only. But he managed well done the website. The website also enabled the department uh, of uh, to increase its visibility internationally, the result of which was an increasing trend of international uh, applicant for public health degree program I mean, in the University of Malaya. In recognition of his interests and ability in health informatics, he was appointed as a manager for NIDI IT, now known as the IT department. At that time, uh, myself as a the director of uh, University of Malaya Medical Center, I'm looking for the good people in IT. Because uh, IT in PPUM uh, actually is the heart of the PPUM. But I, I found the correct person, that is Awang Bugibah. Uh, and uh, that was on the July 24, uh, 2000, while still holding his job as a lecturer at that time. Uh, just a lecturer, but we managed to point him, uh, identify him to be an IT chap and running the heart of the hospital in IT. Then later on, develop hospital information system, uh, immediately he take to revise it. That's why we, we said we got the correct person. And the pharmacy information system was set up and e-prescribing was introduced to the hospital for the first time. Because of his capability, we pursue him, please go for PhD uh, in public health, but in the informative technology, IT. He oversaw the successful interface of a three desperate, I mean, uh, three dis desperate hospital system, that is hospital information system, laboratory information system, and a pharmacy information system, and laid down the foundation for the future IT development in the UMMC before he goes to seek for his PhD, uh, the study leave. During this time, he gained a second master degree, this time an applied statistic, and as a result, is widely recognized in Malaysia in, as a medical statistic consultant. In 2006, uh, Dr. Awang Bugiba completed a PhD in medical informatics at the University of East Anglia, United Kingdom, becoming the first 
Malaysian doctor to qualify with PhD in this field. Congratulations to him. <laughs> Dr. Awang was promoted to associate professor in October 2002 and professor in January 2008. His, his rise from ordinary lecturer to full professor took just uh, 10 years. A record in the Department of Social and Preventive Medicine in September 2006, he was appointed as head for the Department of Social and Preventive Medicine as in a position he held until 31st of August 2009. During his tenure as head of the department, he spearheaded the, re and, I mean, the revamp of the MPH, that is Master of Public Health Program, introduced the Doctor of Public Health, set up a two research center in the department that is a Julius Center UM and Center for the Population Health. Link up the department with several public health and epidemiology departments around the world and won a bid for one of the last of the Asian Link project awarded by the European Commission, namely a clinical epidemiology and evidence-based medicine. Ladies and gentlemen, on the first of September, on the first of September two thousand nine, Dr. Awam Bugiba was appointed as a deputy dean for undergraduate and a diploma program a position he held until June 30th, 2011. 1st July 2011, Dr. Awang was appointed as a director of the Center of a Global Planning and Strategy for the University of Malaya, a position he held until August 15, 2012. During his tenure as a director of the Center for Global Planning and Strategy, uh, he successfully managed the audit which awarded to UM autonom autonomous university status, one of the five public university in Malaysia to achieve this. The UM strategy plan was totally revised and executive information system was set up. The academic icon program was streamlined, UM KPIs were revamped and entire new set of UM excellent award were introduced and a radically new UM management structure was proposed. August 16, 2012, Professor Awam Bugiba was appointed as a Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation for the University of Malaya. Dr. Awang is an Associate Editor for the Asian, the Asia Pacific Journal Public Health and the Malaysian Orthopedic Journal, as well as an International Advisory Board members for Journal of Experimental and Clinical Medicine. He is also an ad hoc statistical, statistical reviewer for the numerous medical journals and he continues, he continues to be an advocate and resource person for improving scientific paper in public health and clinical medicine. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Awang has been a consultant for the Malaysian Aid Council as well as for several private companies. He currently sits on the several national level committee, health promotion, for example, in health promotion board, in the Mosti and higher education at that time, now Ministry of Education, as well as a several other committee within and outside the University of Malaya. Dr. Awang Bugiba has been an external examiner and assessor for several public Public Malaysian and a foreign university, and he was the founding head of the Julius Center University of Malaya, that is short form JCUM, JCUM, and he also created a center for the population held in the University of Malaya in 2009. He was from 2007 to 2009 the chair for the University of Malaya Wellness Program. I uh, hope that his wellness program uh, is showing the output but not to him himself, but to other population in <laughs> University of Malaya. Well, don't worry, that show health as long as it's healthy. <laughs> From 2007 and 2010, uh, he was the Malaysian coordinator for the Asian Link Clinical Epidemiology and Evidence-Based Medicine Program, a project supported by European Commission from 2007 to 2010. In 2008, Professor Awam Bugiba was organizing chair for the 40th Asian Pacific Academic Consortium Public Health Conference in Kuala Lumpur that held between 7 to 9 November 2008. That time, I was the deputy vice chancellor, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. I told him, because why there is a political turmoil 
uh, that WHO doesn't recognize Taiwan because at that time apex president was Taiwanese and then because of that some turmoil within three months I told Awang please take the conference shifted from from Vietnam to Malaysia Kuala Lumpur Malaysia he done beautifully with 600 delegates uh, being present and again I, I, that one saya tabik dia congratulations because within three months he bring the international conference to Kuala Lumpur see how his uh, ability as a leader uh, is group up that's why he's today as a deputy vice chancellor maybe in future we will be a vice chancellor of university of malaya inshallah eh? and also professor awang has published more than 70 peer review journal article and numerous conferences or conference abstracts and currently principal investigator in a new research project one of which is a three million cost high impact research grant project he has supervised and to complete the completion of to a total of 24 postgraduate in public health and is currently a supervisor and advisor for nine, nine doctoral students 2010 is a recognition for his contribution to public health Prof. Awang uh, was made a fellow of the Faculty of Public Health Royal College of Physicians UK one of the only handful fellow from Southeast Asia he was made a fellow of public health medicine in Malaysia by the Malaysian Public Health Physician Association in 2012. 2013, Dr. Awang was made a fellow of the Academy of Medicine of Malaysia and a fellow of the Academy of Science of Malaysia. Become the first public health physician in Malaysia to simultaneously hold these four fellowships. Congratulations to him. He was awarded the Malay Malhijra Award for the Outstanding Achievement in Research and Development by the Sarawak State Government in the year 2013. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, with this, uh, saya dengan ini menjemput Professor Dr. Awam Bergibah Muhammad untuk menyampaikan syarahan perdana yang bertajuk The Realization of a Dream. Welcome, Professor Dr. Awam Bergibah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Profesor Datuk Dr. Amin Muhammad Amin Jalaluddin, uh, Vice Chancellor University of Malaya, my colleagues, Dean of Faculty of Medicine, uh, fellow colleagues from other faculties in University of Malaya, my department uh, colleagues, my former supervisor, I saw her just now, I think, Dr. Hamida. Ah, uh, yes, Dr. Hamida some ex-students of mine uh, who are here. Thank you very much for the, for the very flattering introduction, to Amin. Now, I, several people ask me why my topic is the realization of a dream. But it's actually not my dream, it's the dream of a department. So today I'm not going to talk about myself, I'm going to talk about the department itself. Because I believe it is uh, it is timely that a lecture be given about what the department has done and what uh, the department needs to do in the future. This photograph was taken uh, one nice autumn day. That's me sitting there on the bench, uh, purposely kept in silhouette so you don't see my bulb. <laughs> <laughs> this is in the University of East Anglia, uh, somewhere near the LCR, and uh, I believe that's Nelson Court in the, in the background. So some of you who have been to the University of East Anglia will probably recognize that. And uh, these ropes are the PhD ropes for uh, the University of East Anglia, where I did my, my PhD. Now before I did my PhD, I had this pasted on the wall, this saying pasted on the wall, on my room for three years. We grow great by dreams. All big men are dreamers. They see things in the soft haze of a spring day or in the red fire of a long winter's evening. Some of us let these dreams die, but others nourish and protect them. Nurse them through bad days, till they bring them to the sunshine and light, which comes always to those who sincerely hope that their dreams will come true. So for many years, this guided uh, my principles on how I should achieve the dreams, my dreams, and the dreams of a department. Incidentally, this is attributed to uh, former President of the United States, Sir Woodrow Wilson. Now, 
I became a lecturer, like Datuk Amin said, in January 1998, almost to this very day. It was 16 January 1998. But my path to being a lecturer was not an easy path. In fact, uh, I was a staff in the Ministry of Health for almost 10 years. It's nine and a half years before I became an academic in the University of Malaya. And I came, became a lecturer in UM purely by accident because I failed to get a job in UNIMAS at that time. So in 1997, I applied to UNIMAS, being a Sarawakian, so I thought I'd contribute to the Faculty of Medicine in UNIMAS. So apparently, I was not good enough for UNIMAS, so they rejected me. But rejection is no cause for despair, as I always believe. There have been many challenges in my life uh, all along. Nothing has come easy. And I was, uh, Dr. Amin asked me to become the manager of the UMMC Nadi IT. Uh, at the time, I was a lecturer in the SVM department. So I was a manager for about a year in uh, IDIT. And then I was a PhD student. I left because I told him I can sacrifice not more than one year of my life, uh, my academic career, in, uh, to help straighten out things in IDIT. So I became a PhD student. And I was head of the Department of uh, Social and Preventive Medicine uh, for three years, from 1st September to 31st August. And I thought that 31st August meant Merdeka, so you've been free of the burden, but apparently not. So I, was, uh, I became Deputy Dean uh, on the 1st of September, 2009. I headed the Julia Center for quite some time until I decided that it was really time to let go and somebody more capable to take over uh, my job. It also meant a conflict of interest had I continued to head the Julia Center. So I became Director of Global Planning and Strategy. Um, this was uh, Mantan VC at the time. Tan Sri Gauth asked me to change this unit, the Corporate Planning Unit, to uh, Global Planning and Strategy, and uh, change it entirely. So I think it was a shock to the, to the staff when I came. And I've been a Vice Chancellor, and uh, inshallah, I'll be Vice Chancellor until 15th of August next year. Now, I'm no stranger to turning around departments or units, and I've been given this opportunity as an academic three times in my career so far in UM. NADIIT was the first one, and NADIIT was the most difficult one. This was the most stressful period in my life. Anything after that became nothing in comparison to what I had to undergo. <laughs> Just to tell Dr. Amin that, lah, because he asked me to do this. <laughs> if you can imagine that you had to take care of the IT center of a hospital, and you took no holidays, you were on call 24-7, 365 days a year for that whole year. I did not go for uh, a break in that year, including for Hari Raya, because it was so cr critical that the IT department had to be turned around and, uh, and kept on track. So it was uh, possible to achieve that after six months, but the first six months were really a traumatic six months. So uh, I have to thank Dr. Amin for asking me to turn around at the IT because this gave me a lot of lessons in life. Then I was uh, asked to turn around the department and bring the department up, uh, Department of Social and Preventive Medicine. And I was also asked to turn around the Corporate Planning Unit, now called the Global Planning and, and Strategy Center. All were successful transformations. And the, the, the departments and the units have continued along their path, uh, free of uh, interference from me. I do not interfere with whatever has been done after uh, I left the department or the unit. So in truth, the credit really belongs to the department. It did not belong to me. I may have merely have been the spark which uh, sparked the turnaround, but the credit really belongs to the department. So this lecture is not about me. This lecture is about the journey of a department, which has continued it trans its transformation long after I have left. Now, transformation is not difficult if conditions are right. And a one-off transformation will not be sustainable if a unit or department does not believe in change. I've always believed that. In all the departments, I had the privilege to lead all have continued to change and prosper, leading me to conclude that what we have done must have been very correct or I have been very lucky. This was the SBM department in 2003. There were 15 academic staff at that time, one general master's program, 
a specialty master's program, MPH for specialty training. Hardly any PhD students, if we couldn't find any PhD students at that time. There were no PhD or DRPS qualified staff. There was one, only one MD qualified staff who had left at that time. And I was the first staff to go for a PhD in a very long time. I have to credit uh, Datuk Siraju Norgani with the foresight of planning the uh, manpower uh, development of the department. I invited him here today. I'm not sure whether he's able to make it. I understand he's not been very well uh, these last few months. But he had a vision to see, to see that the department needed to equip itself with the necessary skills and manpower qualified enough to to lead the department into the next century. They were only with 0.5 general papers per staff per year in the department in 2003. And the department only ran one short course per year. So we knew something had to be done. And as a consensus, the department agreed that we had to radically transform ourselves. So we set out to transform ourselves. At this point in time, I wanted to, to insert a video of uh, an excerpt taken from the Transformers movie, which is one of my favorite movies. <laughs> but, <laughs> but my wife pointed out that to me that I'm not sure whether I have the right to do so <laughs> because there is a copyrighted material. So I, I, I didn't want to insert something which I didn't really have the right to display. So we continued the capacity building, which Datuk Siraju Nogani uh, started back. So I was the first one to go for the PhD for a very long time. And we set up a to equip people with PhDs and DRPH. And from none in 2003, there are now 18 PhD and DRPH qualified staff in 2013, in just a matter of 10 years. There was a lot of technology transfer. We gained new skills. And we gained sophisticated research methods and statistical skills. And we were the first department to routinely train students on systematic reviews, bibliography software, multivariate statistical tests. We were the first. So ahead of uh, whatever other departments uh, were doing and what the rest of the university was doing. We created research centers within the departments because we realized that many people were working alone in silos in their own rooms. So first, there was the one research center. And you can see here, this is the star, the cutting from the star. The very tall chap is uh, one of our academic icons, Professor uh, Diedrich Hrabe, People pronounce it as Grobe. It's an academic icon with an age index of 100. So you can imagine how uh, prominent he was. Of course, the fat guy is me. This is a former uh, DVC, Dr. Ikram here. So we set up in partnership with Utrecht University and the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine in Oxford, as well as another Asian partner, the Rumah Sakit Cipto Mangun Kusumo in Indonesia. And we had this project called the Asia Link project in clinical epidemiology and evidence-based medicine. The money lasted three years for us, and it was enough. At that time, Datuk Rafia Salim was the vice chancellor. And I remember presenting this pre proposal to her to set up the Julia Center, University of Malaya. And I told her, all I want from the University of Malaya, Datuk, is recognition of JCUM as a research center. I don't require any money from the University of Malaya for three years. The Asia Link project and the money we will generate through the courses that we will run will pay for all the project offices, the courses that we will run, and so on. And so it was. For three years, we didn't get a single cent from the University of Malaya. Now, the Universe Center, University of Malaya, um, I was the first uh, head of this Julius Center. The current head is uh, Associate Professor Noran uh, Nakia Hairi one of my former students, and probably doing a better job than I ever did with this. And we had we started off with collaborations with Rumah Sakit Cipto Mangun Kusumo, uh, the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine in Oxford, the University Medical Center in Utrecht. This is the UAE University. We still have ongoing things with the University of Leeds. We work with IBM, Ministry of Health. And through the Asia Link project, in November 2007, we ran 15 short courses. 13 of them were joint international efforts in the three years. And we trained uh, 540 participants from all over Southeast Asia, funded by the EU. Of course, we made money also out of this. Uh, the courses were funded by the EU. And we gave out four PhD fellowships for clinical epidemiology and evidence-based medicine. 
under this Asia Link program. Two of these PhD graduates, I'm happy to say, are now back in the department from the Ministry of Health. We managed to, I'm not sure whether there are any Ministry of Health people here, we managed to entice them to join the department. <laughs> one is in primary care and one is in psychological medicine. So those four Asia Link fellows are back uh, in the University of Malaya. We introduced a new clinical epidemiology evidence-based module to the medical curriculum for the very first time. Now the Needle Centre in the University of Malaya currently has 49 doctoral students with seven graduates thus far and four research staff. It has a lot of small, small research grants within that. And it has three uh, bigger grants, the STEM project, Cluster, which has just started under HRR, and the HELP program, which is a UMRG program. The STEM program is doing very well. Uh, in fact, uh, Datuk Lam Saki keeps on offering me money in the hope that I will take up the offer. We started off with only 2.5 million, uh, sorry, 2.4 million, with a target of 24 uh, Q1 papers. Uh, we gained an additional 400,000, so it became 2.8 million uh, for 28 Q1 papers. So far, we have achieved 23 Q1 papers. We are only halfway through the project. And we have already produced quite a number of graduates. The Julia Center is a center of only 10 active researchers, but it has produced 88 ISI journal papers in a single year alone in 2013. The best ever performance in, for the Julia Center. Again, attributed to the head and the staff of the center. It organized the first Asia Pacific Clinical Epidemiology and Evidence-Based Medicine Conference in 2012. I was still the head then and uh, I was organizing chair for that conference. And it's a member of the Global Aging uh, Research Network now. And in March this year, we'll be launching the note on the Malaysian Cochrane Network, which is part of the Australasian Cochrane Network. This will be a, a going activity within the Judah Center. So this was, so again, the fat guy is me. This lady is the, the vice chancellor, receiving the dean of the University Medical Center, Utrecht, and these are just pictures from the Julia Center. So these are some of the workshops that we ran uh, from the within the Julia Center in the last few years. Not content with a single center, because we realized that we were missing a bit, but big part, which is the public health uh, part in the department. We added the second center, and this is a. New, new Straits Times uh, cutting of an interview that was uh, uh, carried out between Professor Peter Gregson, who is the Vice Chancellor of Queen's University of Belfast. He has since uh, finished his term, nine years, as a Vice Chancellor in Queen's, and he has now moved to Cranfield, I believe. And this is, of course, the fat guy is me. So we set up this uh, joint collaboration between Queen's University of Belfast and the uh, University of Malaya and set up the Center for Population Health. Now this center has 56 doctoral students headed by uh, Associate Professor Tedin Su, uh, who is from uh, Myanmar and has staff in our department for the last uh, few years. He has, he has many small projects and has already got three large projects. One is Partner, which is the HTM Cluster flagship project, the MyBCC, and also uh, my heart study. And uh, they told me that they produced 43 ISI journal papers in 2013. And uh, these journal papers do not overlap between the Julia Center and the Center for Population Health. Both the centers jointly ran short courses. And these are usually run with international faculty and participants. We strategize in such a way that when visiting professors were around, we made full use of their ability to run short courses and we used that to attract participants. So this ranged from research methodology to scientific writing and the number of courses have, have risen dramatically over the years. Where the department only ran one single course in 2003, in 2010 it was running 12, in 2011 it was running 10, in 2012 it was running 16 of these short courses just with these two centers. In fact, I joke that it's like one every three weeks. So the department's uh, staff is now so good in running short courses, they, they did not need to call any meeting to run any short courses. The staff know precisely what to do. All they need to do is to know when, who is running it, 
what facilities are needed and the rest is by checklist so no meetings are ever necessary i commented that the the department is running way too many short courses and i think uh, it is true in a sense because when you run too many short courses it takes away time for you to do the teaching the curriculum development as well as the research so these are the courses which the department continue to run uh, in 2011 2012 and of course 2013 the effect of having research centers and the department has seen a tremendous rise in the outputs of the department where there were just minimal incremental increases uh, in outputs the number of uh, isi papers risen dramatically the moment that we got people to work together i have always maintained that the the output of a center which works together is greater than the sum of the individual parts of that particular center because you can then capitalize on the strengths and minimize the weaknesses of the people in that research, research project. Because the occupational physicians were feeling left out. Where's Victor? He had to say we had to form a third center. And the third center was a center for occupational environmental health. Sometimes I think there are way too many centers already in one department. So out of the 15 research centers in the Faculty of Medicine, three are from SPM, despite SPM having only 24 uh, academic staff, which is 5% of the entire faculty, but having 20% of the research centers. We created our own website in 1999. I was the first webmaster. There have been a succession of webmasters over the years. If you asked me to do PHP coding now, probably I've forgotten a lot of uh, a lot of things about PHP coding or creating even basic HTML and so on. But this was the website that we created over the years and the website is still active until today due to the efforts of the successive uh, webmasters. We had very few international students in, 2000 and, and, uh, 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 in the 1990s. But the moment that we created the website, we have seen a, a rise in the number of international students that we have. And a lot of the international students come from many places. Uh, now we're increasingly seeing from Africa as well as from the Middle East. So only two international students in 1995. This increased to, to form now 25 to 50% of the master students in the department itself. And usually there are more than 150 applications for just 50 places that we can afford to offer. We strengthen our links and pass an international links this, this number of links keep on increasing over the years. We are a very active member of the Asia Pacific Academic Consortium for Public Health, which I will elaborate later on. We, of course, started off with the Asia Link uh, project. We were training people from Sudan. We have trained almost 200 public health professionals from, from Sudan over the years. And of course, we still have links with the Ministry of Health, ExxonMobil, NIOSH, uh, Department of Patient Safety and Health, Regional Health Promotion Board, and we employ a number of uh, of part-time staff to teach in the department. The Asia Pacific Academic Consortium for Public Health, we have been an active member for many decades. The immediate past president is actually Dr. Amin himself. And we organized the 40th Asia Pacific Academic Consortium for Public Health Conference in 2008 in just 10 weeks flat. Moved the conference from Hanoi to KL, started from zero, and managed to attract a few hundred participants and made a lot of money in the process. We took over the APEC Secretariat from the University of Hawaii in 2013. So a 70 member, is it 70 or 80 now? 80 member consortium, the secretary is now in the Department uh, of Social and Preventive Medicine. So we learned how to organize international conferences, even in a short time as 10 weeks. And this was the one that we organized back in 2008 when uh, Dato' Amin, who was the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Academic at that time, asked me to organize this uh, conference, actually my immediate reaction was uh, unprintable. <laughs> I thought, I mean, you must be crazy. Right? Organize an international conference in 10 weeks mm -hmm. to, to, to get this. But we managed to make money and not use a single UM, UM uh, single cent of UN money in the process of organizing this conference. We also organized the first Asia Pacific Clinical Epidemiology and Evidence-Based Conference in 2012. We hope that um, probably in 2015, 
we might organize the second one. The this year, um, our the department is organizing another Asia Pacific Academic Consortium for Public Health, the APEC conference, uh, which is slated for October this year. We enhanced our occupational medicine clinic and added external consultancy to it. So the, the occupational medicine clinic is uh, is the first one in Malaysia, the first uh, specialist referral clinic in Malaysia. It's not just a, a simple walk-in clinic, it's a referral, a specialist referral clinic. This is a specialist occupational medicine clinic, which not only does occupational disease management, it also does impairment assessment, medical surveillance, factory visits, and so on. Uh, fortunately, this staff uh, has left. He has joined uh, Soxo. Sorry, yeah, Soxo. Uh, this staff, unfortunately, has followed his wife back to Sarawak and joined Unimas. Yeah, <laughs> so he's more successful than me. <laughs> so he's managed to join Unimas where I was rejected. <laughs> we also do special medical examinations uh, for Soxo and, and others, and uh, we launched the UM Wellness Program. Is, which is a university-wide wellness program. I no longer chair the program, of course. We started in 2008. It is now in the sixth year uh, running, supported by the top management and collaboration with several departments. I'm sorry if I miss any department here, but uh, we, uh, we collaborated with the Department of ONG, Department of Medicine, Department of Surgery, Sports Center, Department of Community Dentistry. And during our launch, we also collaborated with the National Kidney Foundation and LPPKN. I'm not sure whether there are any LPPKN uh, staff here today? No? Ah, yes. So thank you, LPPKN and the National Kidney Foundation for collaborating with us in the launch of our wellness program. This provides general screening, early intervention and treatment, dietary and exercise consultation, and it now has a permanent location in IPPP. I'm not sure how it ended up in IPPP, but probably you can guess. As a side effect of this wellness program, it has produced 11 ISI publications from the project itself, and three doctoral and two master students have graduated with data from the project, and more are still using this project uh, to do their doctoral uh, uh, th uh, thesis. So these are just some pictures. This is from the Department of uh, Dent uh, from the Faculty of Dentistry to help us. This is uh, Teresa, one of our staff, and of course these very happy people. Uh, exercising during the launch of the wellness uh, program. We publish annual reports as a department, an unbroken tradition since 2006. So until now, there is an annual report coming from the Department of Social and Preventive Medicine. So these are reports, all available online in PDF format. You can get a print copy or better still, you can get a PDF format from our website. So what made the difference? The difference was because of a change in focus and plan, and because we set out a strategic plan for the future. For those of you who do not believe in strategic planning, believe me, it works, provided you do it properly. The department was able to predict future trends, so we were ahead of many trends. For example, before UM introduced the ISI policy or the policy requiring publications by its postgraduate students, we were already doing that, and we told the students, you have to produce publications, if not, we won't allow you to submit your thesis. The students didn't know there was never part of the regulations. But it didn't stop us from doing that. So we were able to increase the number of publications we had by introducing this requirement ahead of the university requirement. We told the students that first, any uh, publication will do, then we move to ISI, and the department said that eventually, I told the department, we'll be moving to tier one. Why were we able to predict future trends? Because we followed what NUS had done. And we knew that whatever NUS had done, we eventually be followed by UM. So that was why we were able to predict future trends. <laughs> the department was very willing to change because there was a sense of despair that the department was going nowhere. And the department had to change. It was uh, at that time losing ground to other universities in Malaysia. But if you ask anybody now uh, which department has the best research among public health universities, uh, in, in public health, in, in all the universities in Malaysia, it is no doubt our department. It is no longer any other department. No other department can actually come close to what we are doing now. 
And the department was willing to grow and change as a, as a result of it. The target was to become the first school of public health in Malaysia. What are our strengths? There is a shared vision and clearly stated strategies which uh, should culminate in a, towards a school of public health. I always remark that once you become a school of public health, you have to revise a strategic plan because you have reached a target and therefore new targets have to be set in place. Everyone is committed. We have a metric system where everybody is heading a task force or workforce within the department. We have work teams, postgraduate, undergraduate, short courses, networking, junior research club, website, audit teams, and so on. So we frequently run, for example, pre-audits in the department before any stream audit comes, uh, comes along. We have very strong teamwork. Every year we have orientation week, a program which is for the postgraduates. We have integration day with the postgraduate uh, students and their families. And we have family day with the postgraduate students and their families and of course the staff of the department. All funded by the department workshops and the department uh, short course fund. So the department makes money and runs this. So no other department runs uh, this kind of family days twice a year. And we believe that everybody is worth something, valued contributions. And we support the promotion of those who are qualified. In fact, now the department is so, so full of associate professors. There are, I think, 14 associate professors in the department of 24. Um, I think it's time for some of them to graduate and become professors too, is what I remark. That they really should be pushing, pushing themselves to become professors in the department. And we have a monthly birthday celebration uh, which is funded by our welfare fund. We actually bring out a cake for the staff of the department and sing happy birthday. <laughs> Me included, <laughs> sing happy birthday. Of course, it's quite nice to have the birthday cake, uh, not so good for my figure. Which, uh, <laughs> but we do it every month after the department meeting, every month. So it's a routine. Whosoever, whose birthday is that month, we will sing happy birthday to that person and ask that person to do this unhealthy habit of blowing out the candles. <laughs> I always believe in these few things. You have to dream big. You have to work hard and stay focused. And you have to surround yourself with good people. Only then can you grow a unit, an organization, a department. These have always been my guiding principles in management. And I believe that the successive uh, heads of department have embraced this principle of dreaming big. If they don't dream big enough, I will push them to dream bigger. They have to work hard and they have to stay focused and they must get the very best people into the department. The transform department now has 24 academic staff, 18 of them have doctoral degrees and they come from multiple disciplines. Not only they have doctoral degrees, but it's quite common to find uh, people in, in, in my department to have two or three master's degrees. So it's my uh, own qualifications are not uncommon. I have two master's degrees, my MPH as well as applied statistics. There are several in the department who have uh, not only in their own discipline, but MBAs, management, uh, as well as environmental management, and so on. They've got multiple master's degrees. So we were the first department to have and con contain to uh, continue to sustain our own website since 1999, and we totally revamp and semesterize our MPH and MS Science PH program in 2008. We changed from a term system to a semester system. Very painful exercise because we were so used to the term system. It took about a year for us to straighten out, and we had a dry run for a year, in which we ran everything according to the semester system except the exam. And the next year, we converted entirely to the semester system. We were the first department to have its own doctoral program. And we managed to persuade, sorry, Ministry of Health, to use this as the standard for public health training in uh, Malaysia. So the first graduates uh, in 2013, your MC here for today, Ravza, is one of the first graduates of this DRHPH program who graduated in the last convocation. Incidentally, she is uh, one of my ex-students. So I was able to bully her today and to become the MC for today. <laughs> we have an increasing number of postgraduate students with a total of now 130. 25 to 50 percent of them are international. And we have so many research assistants, I really do not know who they are in the department. And despite just being a department, we have our own postgraduate unit to manage our postgraduate students because there are so many of them. So we have been doing that for the last uh, 10 years or so. 
We have a regular annual report since 2006, like I mentioned just now. And we had a strategic planning retreat, which I think is one of the milestones in the department in August 2008. There's a concerted effort for international linkages. And there are three now, three research centers in the department. I do not think we should form any more research centers because there are just way too many already now. And we had a publication policy ahead of UM requirements at that time. We have a wellness program, which started in 2008, now in the sixth year running. We routinely run around 15 short courses every year with the own short course fund, which funds then the other department extracurricular activities. We revamped the old MPH program in 2007, and with now uh, a quarter to half of the students being international. We have we still maintain the first referral occupational medicine clinic in Malaysia. We have a wellness center, a few million research grants, and the total publications, I think this is probably wrong. It's probably exceeded 100 now in uh, 2013. By the time it's indexed in, uh, in uh, ISI in May, it will probably exceed, I think, this number. And we have many research collaborations from around the world. And we have the staff awarded with many consultancies from the Ministry of Health, uh, not sure what MHR stands for, WHO, SOCSO, and so on. And we are now having a student exchange program with Wuhan, uh, Sydney, Mahidon, Newcastle, uh, Malaysia. Uh, and we are thinking of a double MPH program with Kyoto University. And there's already ongoing joint supervision of PhD with Queen's University, Belfast. And because of this, uh, we are given national and international recognition. And we have, set, we have brought the APEC Secretariat to the department uh, last year. So now we are host to the APEC Secretariat office. And the Julia Center is now part of the Malaysian Cochrane uh, Network and the Global Aging Research Network and also the Clearing House Center for Adolescent Health. And the department is organi has organized two conferences in the last few years and it's already uh, been entrusted with the organization of the 46th APEC conference, which is going to be held in October this year. Now, this picture was taken in Pamukkale, Turkey, uh, as the sun was setting. Uh, when I reflect back on the, in the picture, the sun was setting very rapidly. Mamukale is a, an area in, in Turkey which has got a lot of very hard water, so a lot of salt deposits there. And at that time, I, I did not have a digital camera. It was a film camera. This was back in the good old days when film reigned supreme. And the sun was setting. So I had to make up my mind whether to get the correct exposure or just shoot the picture. So. I just shot the picture. I didn't know what exposure to, to make. It was no time. The sun was taking like what, 15 seconds of setting, so rapidly setting. If we didn't shoot the picture, you would have lost it. And that has guided my principle too. If something is worth doing, you need a quick decision, do it first. Worry about the consequences later on. But you have to think very, very quickly of the possible. If the risks are too great, then of course you should, should not do it. But if the benefits really outweigh the risk, you have to grab that opportunity first. And I've always advised uh, my younger staff that if the door opens for you, or if the, if the door half opens for you, walk in. And never abandon your dreams just because someone living their nightmare told you to. Never listen to someone who has just got negative perceptions in mind. Never, because there are so many positive examples out there. Now, when we had the strategic planning retreat in Port Dixon back in 2008, this, this was one of the activities that we held. But honestly, this is what we're feeling too at that retreat. We felt we were blundering about going to an unknown future, trying for an unknown dream, blindfolded. So this was one of the activities that we had in that PD uh, retreat. We had lots of uh, fun. This is an alumnus of the University of Malaya, Professor Alta Ching. He's working at the UAE uh, University now. He was there too. This is Datuk Sirajun Nogani, uh, previous uh, head of department, uh, now retired. Uh, of course, this is what, uh, one of the things that we produced as part of the retreat, and we put that into a plan. We had a second retreat uh, about a year ago to formalize what would go into this new entity that we would call 
the School of Public Health. And we had this uh, retreat. I was invited. Uh, there's a fat guy, that's me. I was invited as a, as a member of the department, although I, I didn't really contribute very much to the department. And I was only come, able to come for one morning. But it was worth it. On the 29th of August 2013, the UM Senate debated and approved the rationalization of faculties. There would be five large faculties in schools and one academy. I believe these faculties are going to be called colleges rather than uh, faculties, perhaps now. But there will be five plus one. And among the schools approved under the Faculty of Health Sciences is the Graduate School of Public Health. Why the Graduate School of Public Health? Because I do not see a future for an undergraduate program in public health in Malaysia. So the department has finally realized its dream of becoming a graduate school of public health five years after its strategic planning retreat, which planned for that very same thing in 2008. The Graduate School of Public Health. What is next for this particular school? I see three grand challenges of the future. Nothing to do with the grand challenge programs that we, we are going to, to announce uh, very, very soon. One is the lifestyle, rise in lifestyle of diseases. Second is the aging population which you're going to face. And the third is rapidly spreading infectious diseases. The rise in lifestyle diseases like heart disease, cancers, and so on are in tandem with the sedentary lifestyles and environmental changes that we have we face today. Preventive and promotive care is probably more cost effective than curative care. But the kind of funding that the government gives for curative care far outweighs that of uh, preventive care. We desperately need a healthcare system and healthcare financing model that recognizes this fact. Unfortunately, we do not yet have this particular model in place. We do not want this to be commonplace. We do not want ambulance screams to be very commonplace on our streets in the future. And we do not want this to be commonplace in the future. By 2035, 10% or more of our population will be at least 60 years or older, probably even more than this if our fall in our fertility rates are anything to go by. Healthcare must recognize this fact and take steps to prepare for it. And the future healthcare system must cater for this group of people. Retirement homes like this may become commonplace. Apple Ridge is about friendship. Look, this Apple Ridge is about feel, okay, I would lifestyle. In this kind of retirement home. Apple Ridge is Looks about like a resort to me. choice. <laughs> Apple Ridge is about all this and more. Welcome to your new neighborhood, Apple Ridge Senior Living, where we're passionate about enhancing the lives of seniors. Visit AppleRidgeSeniorLiving.com today and find out more about the Apple Ridge experience. So I hope we won't see many of these advertisements in the future, but who knows? This is senior living right, in, the, in, in, in the resort. Of course, uh, it might cost us a lot of money. Infectious diseases will spread faster than ever before, and emerging and re-emerging diseases pose a major threat to Malaysians today. The ability to harness all healthcare resources is the key to controlling outbreaks. Unfortunately, at, the partic at this particular moment, the responsibility for, for uh, controlling outbreaks rests primarily with the Ministry of Health. I believe this model has to change. It has to change in the future. If we are not able to harness all healthcare resources, including private and university healthcare resources, we will not be able to cope with rapidly spreading infectious diseases. This is a heat map visualization, and I would encourage uh, people uh, working in public health, for example, um, to look at the use of social media to track uh, the spread of, uh, of diseases, particularly infectious diseases. So this is a heat map visualization observed through public Twitter data. 
So you can see right away where the concentrations, for example, of people talking about uh, infectious diseases or flu, for example, are by just looking at the Twitter that is spread. As Twitter and Facebook become more ubiquitous uh, in the future, this becomes a tool for us to then pinpoint where outbreaks can occur. We know that infectious diseases are spreading faster than ever before. I'm glad to see uh, Prof. Sazali here from Tidrek, uh, here, because he must recognize, he will recognize that infectious diseases are a very important part of the uh, cost to the healthcare uh, in Malaysia today. Prof. Adiba, of course, uh, being an infectious disease consultant, also knows this. Let's take a look at how quickly, for example, H1N1 spread throughout the world in just a matter of one month. So we look at uh, how WHO, this is WHO, so I guess it's, it's, it's not copyrighted, so I can use Announcing the arrival of Professor Datuk Dr. Muhammad Amin Jalaluddin, Vice Chancellor, University of Malaya, and Professor Dr. Awang Bugiba, Awang Mahmud. Building up selected resources and facilities, extending and strengthening collaborative networks. The new roles will include advanced training for future public health professionals, advocacy for a better quality of life, an advisory role to governments and NGOs, as well as active involvement in niche areas. The dream is slowly taking shape, but potential pitfalls still remain. I see a few potential dangers in the new school of public health. One is the inability to sustain the momentum. Number two be the lack of understanding of future 
SPH rules. And number three, the inability to read the situation and predict trends. And lastly, the inability to prepare for the future. And of course, to identify niche rules. This is my advice to the new Graduate School of Public Health. Dream big, inspire others. At my professor interview back in 2007, I think Dr. Rafia Salim was there, she, she, I think she looked up and said, asked the very same question which she asked every other guy who wanted to become professor. So doctor, why the hell should we, well not why the hell, <laughs> why, why should we promote you? So I, I said something which uh, I think totally surprised her and I said, that too, it's because I inspire others. Anyone can write papers, anyone can do research, but few people can inspire others to reach heights which they thought were not possible before. So I think this is one of my adv advice to the uh, new School of Public Health. You have to dream big and you have to inspire others. And I've always maintained that if your dreams don't scare you, they're just not big enough. So you've got to think of dreams which are bigger and bigger until they really, really scare you. And then you know that that is the best dream for your, for your school. Now, I always believe that our background and circumstances may have influenced who we are, but we are responsible for who we become. And I rem I'm reminded every day that we are very small in this universe. We are very, very small in stature. And there are a lot of things that we do not know. And I'm reminded of this by this uh, 